Yes, please. Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, we will now have uh, Thomas Cameron presenting you on OpenShift for Operators. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Thomas Cameron. I am a senior principal cloud engineer at Red Hat. And uh, I'm going to cover about four days worth of training in 35 minutes. So buckle up, buttercup. <laughs> My contact info is up there. I'm Thomas at RedHat.com. Yes, I've been there that long. Um, and you can follow me on Twitter at Thomas D. Cameron. We are going to be covering quite a bit of stuff. Um, I'm going to talk about setting up the machines for OpenShift. I'm doing this in a Rev environment. I'm assuming you're in an enterprise environment that has something like Rev or VMware or something like that using satellite. Um, but everything that I talk about here, you can do manually. I'm just showing you how to do it a little bit easier uh, in an enterprise environment. So we'll talk about satellite. Satellite Rev, creating a temple, the build, some add-on software, storing the template, using the template, uh, installing packages, and using Ansible playbooks. And then we'll get into uh, the configuration and installation. So very, very briefly, um, when you're setting up the environment to install your OpenShift nodes, uh, I set up uh, content views inside of Satellite. And this kind of got me. Be aware that if you're using Satellite, um, when you are syncing the channels for the Ansible components that are required for this. They don't appear under the operating system branch. You actually have to go over to the other tab and then uh, scroll down and enable Ansible Engine 2.4. And it needs to be 2.4 per the installation docs for OpenShift 3.10 Enterprise. So the way that this looks is you create the content view and make sure that you've got all the components in the content view. I did one content view for the operating system, so all the bells and whistles for the OS. Uh, and then I did another OpenShift content view that I added Ansible Engine, the fast data path, and the OpenShift container platform. And then I created a composite content view with both of those so that I had all of that content available to the machines that I'm installing. I created an activation key so that when I register the systems to the satellite, everything just works. So I created the activation key and I added in the repositories that were part of that so it's super easy. Again, I don't expect you to pick all of this up because we're moving quickly, but I'm just talking about the software channels that you need to make available in an enterprise environment to make this work. This is what it winds up looking like when I go through and I set up my repository sets. Um, notice that I had to manually override almost all of the ones, that, well, all the ones that you see that are uh, overridden by default when you add those repositories to your activation key, they're not on. The repositories are not turned on, so I, I overrode that in the activation key, and that way when you register the systems, they have access to all the software repositories you need. From a rev perspective, um, I built the OS, set optimization, set the name. Again, I'm going to move through this very quickly. Um, but I created a template first. Uh, because I'm using a virtualized environment, I don't want to kickstart a whole bunch of machines. So I just create the template. Um, and this is what that looks like. I build it. I set the operating system. I set the optimization for server. Give it a name. Um, I set up the memory amounts. So, or actually, let me go back one. Um, the other thing that I did was I set up uh, two disks for storage. That was actually a requirement from a previous version of OpenShift. So you can ignore that second disk if you want. But uh, I did that for for the 3.7, and then I realized when I was doing 3.10, oh, they took care of storage for us, so I don't have to do that anymore. Yes. All right, so set memory. I did uh, eight gigs of memory, but you can change that once you're building from the template. Um, I built the machine. I didn't partition that storage drive uh, because, again, we take care of that now. Make sure that you install the Cotello consumer RPM so the system can be registered to the satellite server, and you install that off of the satellite server. Um, and then I installed the OS and common packages needed, so uh, I registered the machine to the satellite server. I made sure that it was registered correctly. I installed uh, the necessary software to interact with the satellite server just so that I can uh, install all my packages. And then I also installed the packages for uh, Rev agents so that the systems would show up under Rev. So RevM guest agent common, it installs that. Um, install the packages that are recommended in the installation docs. So wget, git, net tools, blah, 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 blah. You have to install all of those. Now, I'm lazy. I cheat, and I do a yum group install base. So I have all of the you know IF config and all the old school Unix stuff because I'm old. Um, and... So that stuff gets installed. Um, I updated the machine and rebooted as per the instructions. So do yum-y update and then reboot, um, blah, blah, blah. 
And then I installed OpenShift Ansible. So this is a change from previous versions. It used to be the, op the Atomic installer. So OpenShift Ansible, it drags in a bunch of other packages. Um, and then uh, you need to install Docker as well. So just yum y install Docker. So you get those packages installed. Um, then what I do is I remove all the unique host information for this VM. So MAC address, network UID, SSH server keys, and so on. So I just uh, edited the IF config file, took out the UUID because that is unique, and this is going to be a template. And then I also deleted all the SSH keys, and I unregistered the machine from the satellite server and then shut it down. So you can do um, subscription manager unregister and then init zero. So boop, down it goes. Create a template from that. I'm not going to go into the details super deeply because it's going to depend on your virtualized environment, but I just uh, created the template. Um, in this case, I did uh, QCAL2 so that it uh, could be spun up quickly in a production environment. Use RAW. Um, QCAL2 is copy on write, so your initial writes to the disks are going to be slow, and that's going to make your OpenShift environment slow. Uh, so I made the template. You can see that it's locked while I'm creating the template, uh, and then it goes from locked to available, and we're in good shape. So that's what the template looks like. Um, you can then delete the original if you want to uh, from the template, and I'm going to move through this, or delete the template from the satellite server, and then also uh, delete it from Red Hat Virtualization as well, because we don't need that original, we just need the template, so I go in there, delete it, and it's good to go. So then I create the new VMs. Again, I'm going to go real quickly through this. The one thing that you do want to uh, do is on the master node, it needs 16 gigs. Remember, we created the template with eight. So I just go in and I uh, customize it a little bit, give it the name, give it the memory, change that from uh, eight gigs to 16 gigs, and the machine is locked until it gets created. And then lather, rinse, and repeat for the other nodes. So boom, you create OSE2 through OSE5. I'm doing a five node cluster. Um, so now we've got the machines up and running, or we've got them installed, now we're going to get them up and running. Um, I'm going to uh, change, now here's here's kind of a gotcha. I like to use DHCP for all of my network stuff, um, so what I had to do was I had to go get the MAC addresses from these machines, add them into my DHCPD.com file, uh, then you have to create DNS, and I'll talk more about DNS in a little while, but if you've installed OpenShift, you know that you've got to have this, uh, this zone that's specific to your OpenShift environment, this child's zone. So my zone in my home office is tc.redhat.com. I created the OpenShift, not really subdomain, but uh, I gave it names. And then I'll talk more about the cloud apps in a minute. That's where your applications are going to live. So reboot them. They come back up. Um, and when they do come back up, they've got the right IP addresses. We're in good shape. Oh, and the, uh, the host names resolve correctly. Before, they were just like host one, host two, host three. So that stuff resolves. You have to set up passwordless SSH so that the machines can log into each other. It's just SSH key gen and then copy the keys to the other machines. Like I said, in DNS, you need to set up um, the DNS wildcard for the subdomain. In this case, I did cloudapps.openshift.tc.com. That's where all the apps are going to live. Uh, that's what that looks like again. So I've got the hosts that are going to be in the cluster, and then the applications that I'm going to spin up will live in the cloudapps.openshift.tc.redhat.com zone. <clears throat> And they all resolve back. This is a gotcha. Um, when you do this, make sure that the host that you are pointing at with that uh, wildcard is one of the nodes that's actually going to be serving up um, uh, content. I The first time I did this, I didn't read the docs right, and I thought, oh, well, it needs to go to the management node. That is not correct. You want it to, to point at one of the worker nodes. Um, you want to make sure that DNS is working in both forward and reverse. This will bite you. I promise you want to make sure DNS is working forward and reverse. Um, and you want to check the wildcard. So I did host foo, and I got that .48, and then host bar, and I got that .48. So you want to make sure that that wildcard is working. Anything that you search in that uh, zone should come up with that address. Um, firewalling, we actually, I'm going to skip over this because this is also old information. The new installer for 3.10 just works. It just gets all the firewall rules set up. So I'm going to blast past this. Um, let's see. Yeah. Yeah, there's a few steps involved. Um, now, I'm lazy because I was doing this in a lab environment. I just said, oh, open up all the ports for my local subnet from 1 to 65.534. Don't do that. That was, uh, I was being lazy. 
Hey, what can I say? Um, so then, then you're going to re-register these hosts to satellite. Again, use that, uh, that activation key that you used earlier. Boom, boom, boom for one in host, blah, blah, blah. Register or use an Ansible playbook for it. They're all subscribed. They show up correctly. The host name's correct. Everything's good there. Um, install NFS utils uh, so that if you're using NFS-backed storage, you can actually access it. So I installed NFS utils across all the machines. Here's where we get into sort of the intricacy of the installation. Install the, ho the uh, Ansible hosts file. Um, there's an example at access.redhat.com under the OpenShift documentation. Um, this was really, I will, I will not lie, this was a little bit challenging to get this host file set up correctly um, because it's just a generic example and there's some things in it that are frankly just not, not, they don't work right. So you literally just copy and paste one of the examples. I use this one where there's a single master, a single LED CD, both running on the same machine and multiple nodes. Um, and so I copied that over to my local machine under Etsy Ansible hosts, or you can put it in another location, but that's the default location. Um, verify that the type of installation is OpenShift Enterprise. If you're doing Enterprise, if you're doing Origin, set it to Origin. Um, and then you've got to define the etcd server, uh, the master, and the workers, and the in infrastructure nodes. So the way that that looks is you're going to define what your master node is, what the etcd node is, and then um, all of the worker nodes. Previous versions of OpenShift, the master node was not schedulable. We couldn't run jobs on it. Be aware that in newer versions, 3.9 and 3.10, it is scheduled. I think it's 3.9 and 3.10. Uh, but, it's, uh, but it is schedulable. So your master is no longer kind of a wasted node just doing management stuff. It can actually serve out content. Um, now, if you don't uncomment this line, um, the default behavior is that no one can log in on the web UI. So we did that intentionally. We want you to make a conscious decision about what type of authentication you're going to use. So I just uncommented the line so that it's going to use HT passwords. You can integrate it with all kinds of authentication backends. Just be aware. The OREG URL line, comment that out because it points at a bogus location. If you comment it out, it just uses the default and it goes and grabs content from us. So comment that line out. Uh, and that one killed me. I fought with that for like an hour trying to figure out why my OpenShift node wasn't being able to come up. So just be aware of that. Then you run the playbook. Um, so I actually said um, Ansible playbooks dash I, but since I put it in the default location, since I did it under Etsy Ansible hosts, I didn't really have to do that. But this syntax is important if you put your hosts file somewhere else, that config file that, that defines how the hosts are going to be set up. So uh, you run the prerequisites YAML file first. And again, this is all in the documentation. But you run the prerequisites first, and then let that run, and it gets through and it completes successfully. Uh, and then you run the actual deploy cluster YAML file. These take a while, and it's going to take longer if you have multiple uh, nodes in your cluster. So mine was a five-node cluster running on some big honking ProLiant machines with a ton of memory and very fast CPUs and super fast storage, and it still took like half an hour. So it takes a while. Um, so it'll run through, and hopefully, if the OpenShift gods are smiling, you'll get this at the end with the green OK. Uh, it took me a few tries uh, because I had to figure out some of the syntax changes in that host file, but when it gets done, now you should be able to uh, set up authentication and log into the console. So what you can do is verify in the Etsy origin master master config.yaml file that um, that the HT password or the identity provider section is set up for HT password auth uh, and figure out where the file is that you're going to use for your authentication. So Etsy origin master HT password is the default location based on that um, uh, example file. So what you can do is you can now create the user. You have to have the, um, the Apache Utils package involved for the HT password file. But you run HT password dash C to create a new user. And you point it to the HT password file. And the username is T Cameron. It'll prompt you for the password. And once you're done with that, uh, you can take a look at that HT password file. And you'll see that you've got the uh, password in there in a, an obfuscated format. So now what you can do is you can log in with the web UI and kind of test to make sure that the system's up and running. Uh, you're going to connect to the machine at https colon slash slash your URL and then port 4443. 
um, and you'll get the sort of standard pop-up that says, hey, this is not private. Uh, be aware of that. Uh, you're just going to accept it and get logged in, and you're going to use that username and password that you created earlier on the command line. So T Cameron and the password, and now you've got the web UI. You can start creating applications. So life is good there. The system came up the way that we expected. Uh, you also want to test from the command line that you can uh, run commands uh, logged in on the console. Um, now you can conf you can do this if you have the OC commands installed on a workstation, like at your desk or something like that. Um, you can use OC login, and it'll it'll create your config file. So OC login and then the URL if you want to do it. Um, in this case, I was on the master node, so I just did uh, OC login dash UT Cameron and it asked me for my password. Uh, and it said, you don't have any projects. It's a simple uh, environment. You can create a new project or a new application from the command line. Uh, but you can look at the config file and you can see it's got all kinds of information in it. It's got authentication information and stuff like that. Uh, you also want to log in as admin. This is kind of important because uh, until the admin account is created in two places and until you log in from the command line as admin, it doesn't get created on the back end and I'll show you what that looks like in a little while. So uh, this only works from a node. So on the master, I did OC login dash U system colon admin. So I'm, I'm using a system role and administrator, and it creates my user account and then gives me access. And you'll notice that once I'm logged in as administrator, I can now see all of the projects, which are all the services that are running that help manage the environment. So you know I can see all my Kube, uh, uh, Kubernetes services that are running, logging, the OpenShift service itself, the Ansible service broker, uh, infrastructure, node services, and so on. These are all actually containers that are running in the environment that are um, managing all of the services that are being uh, handled by the OpenShift cluster. Now, I can do something like OC status and once I'm logged in as administrator. And this will give me a cluster-wide status. And you notice that it points over to the management node, OSC 1.openshift, blah, 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 blah. And it'll tell you about all of the services that are running. And I mean, it's page after page after page. You get a lot of good information uh, of what's running on the environment. I can do OC get nodes just to see what my machines are doing, what, my, what the nodes in the environment are doing. And this is actually really helpful. Um, if you see like status not ready, you can start digging into logging and looking at OC status on on the node and figure out try to figure out what's going on there. So and I actually did not even catch that wasn't ready. I got to go look at that. I literally finished these slides like ten minutes ago. So you know, in fine Red Hat form, right? It's a new version of the software. Got up at like four o'clock this morning, running through the labs, trying to make sure that this stuff's all correct. <laughs> Um, and then you can do OC get pods to see what is uh, what pods are running in your environment, what they're doing. So you got like the registry, the console, the router services. Um, you can see what the status of them is, if they're working, if they've had to restart or anything like that. And then for a lot more information than you probably ever wanted, um, you can do OC describe all and then pipe that to less or something like that. And I mean, it is page after page after page. This is actually, as an operator, this is really handy because you can dig down and look at all of the service descriptions. You can dig down and see if there's a status, you know, if, if something isn't ready, you can uh, page through this and see everything that's going on on pretty much every uh, node in your environment. So now what you can do, now that it's all up and running and you've logged in and you've tested that your connectivity is there, you can actually create an application. Now, I'm an operator. I come from a long background. I was a, I was a, I'm dating myself. I was a Novell sysadmin back in the early 90s. Okay, there's somebody out here as old as me. Uh, so I was a Novell sysadmin. Uh, I went to work for Microsoft back in 94 because I was kind of the, the new kid in, on the block. Um, so I was an MCSE after that. Um, been doing this for a long time. Um, but my point here is I went you know, through all this whole career of administration and operations. I am not a developer. And so uh, when I was doing this presentation or when I was submitting presentations, I was like, I want something for OpenShift that it's targeted at me and people like me. So I'm going to talk about building the applications, but honestly, man, me building an application is is silly because I'm not. You don't want me writing code. Like I, it's just it's not good, not at all. 
But here's what the UI looks like. Once you get logged in, you do get a UI, and this is one of the things that I love about OpenShift is that it has got, from the, from the factory, sort of, um, we've got a ton of options for you know, platforms, for um, languages, for application services, and so on. So you can go in and you can drill down and start building applications. Uh, like in this case, I, I decided, okay, I can do Apache, right? I can do a simple Apache server. That's not a problem. So I go in and I define what I want my Apache server to look like. Um, I give it a name, you know, my first Apache project. I don't really need to fill a whole lot of the other stuff out because it will it will know to go and grab, depending on what you selected, we pre-populate, like where it's going to go grab the content uh, for the container for Apache. So the git URL is in there. Um, now, here's something that I have run into in the past. I will verify the application host name, uh, and in a lot of cases, like whatever I put up above TC Apache or whatever, make sure that you put the domain name for your environment. If you let it auto-populate, I've seen cases in the past where it'll auto-populate with some name that actually doesn't resolve in DNS. I don't <laughs> don't know exactly why that's why that's like that, but so verify that your application host name has uh, is resolvable, um, or at least that it comes back, you know, that wild card to cloud apps. Remember that I talked about earlier that we set up in DNS? So some name that shows up in the cloud apps.openshift.tc.redhat.com or whatever your domain name is. Um, and so you click on create and it takes a few minutes and you can click on continue to the project overview uh, and then you can go and watch the process where it's downloading the, the software from GitHub and so on and so forth. So here's what that looks like. You can watch the builds um, and if you expand this out you can actually see um, you know, what the URL is that it created. It'll tell you that the build is pending, um, the Apache web server is pending um, and if, as you watch it for a while and the screen refreshes is you should actually see, you know, you can even see where it's going and grabbing stuff out of GitHub. So you can watch the progress there. It's pretty cool. And from an operations perspective, that's actually really helpful because you will get, you'll see where if it can't connect or something like that, you should see that information as well. So now, once it's all completed and you, you transition from, see how over here the pod is kind of grayed out? Once your application is up, once your container is up, that pod will then turn solid blue, and now you know that the system is, or your container is up and running, so you can look at the URL right there and open it up in a new web browser. And there's your application. At this point, you would uh, grab the content, you would clone it, you could make changes, push it out there, and, and put your application into production. Not me, though, because I'm a terrible developer. <laughs> Um, so, and at this point, you've done, you've jumped through all the hoops, you've got all this stuff set up, uh, and you can start allowing developers to access the, the containers. As I said, you know, because we got 35 minutes and, oh man, I actually finished way early, um, I wanted to move really, really quickly uh, because, you know, th these are short sessions and because uh, the, the key points that I really want to make is, or the key points that I want to make are, when you're setting this stuff up in an enterprise environment, you know, you really want to make your life as operators as easy as possible. Um, as an operator, because you know, you're usually going to be using virtualized environments that are enterprise virtualized environments, not like you know, a KVM instance on your laptop. Um, it is important, and, and uh, you guys will get this slide deck later on, but it is really important that you pay attention and make things like your templating, and make things like your software distribution uh, through satellite or through RHN or through you know, whatever. Um, make sure that that stuff is nailed down up front. Um, as I've gone through all the different iterations of OpenShift, you know, we do change things uh, from release to release. You know, I, like I said, I was up in the speaker's room like 10 minutes before this, like cursing because I couldn't get some stuff to work. Now, it turned out that it was silly DNS issues and mostly on me, not on the software. But, um, but, but the big thing that I want you to take away from this is if you get your fundamentals from an operations perspective, nailed down. Make sure that you've got a good template. Make sure that you've got good access and make sure that you do update your systems so that when you're building uh, your environments out, they are secure. Then as an operator, your life is gonna be so much easier. Um, just out of curiosity, because I did finish a lot earlier than I thought, um, just out of curiosity, how many folks work in enterprise environments and are dealing with OpenShift? 
Okay. So, all right, and raise your hand if you're using virtualized environments like VMware or Rev or something like that. Okay, cool. So, uh, and then raise your hands if you guys are doing uh, enterprise Linux or uh, raise your hand if you're using enterprise Linux versus a respin or something like that. Okay, cool. All right. Excellent. So, um, really, that's it. I mean, that's a ton of information in a ridiculously short amount of time. Uh, but I think uh, what I'll do now is just open it up to any questions. That was that was faster even than I intended. Sorry. Yes, sir. Um. So my question goes beyond sort of what you presented and mm -hmm. to the developer's use of OpenShift. Mm -hmm. So I know with OpenShift, it's sort of a PaaS experience. You push your code directly to uh, OpenShift as a Git endpoint. Um, the way we're used to building software is we build it and we generate an artifact and then we mm -hmm. promote that artifact through environments. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, how do I how do I create a similar workflow with OpenShift? That's a great question for a developer. <laughs> now, in, in all seriousness, um, I don't know if you saw when I was going through the screen that had all the pre-canned applications, we actually have the ability to set up an entire Jenkins infrastructure so you can do a workflow. Um, you can point it at your either an existing Git repository, you know, uh, and then you can build, you know, kick off automated build processes, uh, or you can uh, point it to upstream GitHub and start build processes that way. So. The whole concept of having that sort of a workflow, that pipeline, the development pipeline, we've built that into OpenShift with an expectation that yes, you're going to spin up Jenkins or whatever your favorite um, CI CD environment is. You can set that stuff up, and then your developers who are going to know better, like what your dev and QA and UAT and pro, you know, whatever that cycle looks like. But yeah, you can you can absolutely do exactly what you described, either behind the firewall on a private Git repository or out on GitHub or whatever. Does that answer your question? Whew, I answered a developer question. Are you proud of me? <laughs> Actually, it's really more operations, but you know. Um, what else? Yes, ma'am. Um, what exactly is the licensing on OpenShift? It's a little confusing when it's, I look at it. It says something about the Apache license. Yep, that... yep. It is just like every other product that Red Hat releases. It is an open source license. We don't sell licenses for software. We sell subscriptions. Um, and those subscriptions cover open source licenses from the Apache Software Foundation license to GPL, you know, various versions of GPL, and so on. So when you purchase a subscription for OpenShift, you're not paying a license for the software. You're paying for the support. You're paying for you know access to the documentation. You're paying for um, the updates, the bug fixing, all the engineering that we do on the back end. So you can absolutely go. And here's the other cool thing. You can go and download the upstream OpenShift, um, and you can run it in your environment. Uh, you just and it's it's pretty similar. It's almost identical to what we've got, depending on how far ahead the community is versus our commercial product. Um, but you don't get support. You don't get you know consulting services. You know it's it's basically what we're doing is we're wrapping up support, hardening, certification with third parties, etc., etc., etc. And that's what you're paying for when you buy the subscription, not the software itself. So you would, if you upload it and put it on your own server, you would get the community updates if you wanted? Exactly. How often does Red Hat incorporate community updates? What are we at, about a six-month release cycle right now, Dan? About six months? Three months. Three months. Oh gosh. Okay. Yeah. Which is why I can't keep up. So yeah. So we so we will take from upstream, and what we do is we're behind upstream because what we do is we'll take the upstream release, we'll code freeze it at a certain point in time, apply a bunch of bug fixes to it, certify it with third parties, generate documentation in multiple languages, get our consultants trained. You know, blah 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 blah. There's a ton of stuff around it. Yeah. And so so yeah. I mean, the the upstream is actually awesome, but it's kind of wild west. And I will be the first one to admit, like, I've been doing this since 1993. I'm not an idiot. 
I think. Um, and and man, you know, there are times where I struggle, and it's silly stuff. You know, I I messed up my DNS config, you know, and it blew up, and I'm like pulling my hair out trying to figure stuff out. But um, but but OpenShift is not a trivial product. There are a lot of concepts you need to understand. You know, we talked about everything from like storage backends. We talked about um, you know doing updates. We talked about how to how to build your cluster, what the various roles are, and so on. I mean, there's a there's a lot involved in in setting it up. So um, with upstream, man, it's a lot of fun, but it can be challenging. Any other questions? I know I'm the last person between you and lunch. Everyone's like, no, shut up. <laughs> All right, was this helpful from an operations standpoint? Good, because everything else here seems to be developer-focused, and I feel like the last man standing. Like, okay. Hey, guys, thank you so much for coming. On behalf of Red Hat, we appreciate you being here. And on behalf of DevConf, we appreciate you coming. You guys have a great day. Thank you, Thomas. Um, uh, before we head to... Oh, hang on, hang on. Announcement. Uh, yeah, just a couple of announcements. Um, so 